So today we're going to begin our first day covering springs. And springs are uh, one of my more favorite topics in this course. Uh, one of the reasons for that is springs give you a really uh, kind of a nice uh, topic upon which we can cover the idea of design. So design is a, an interesting thing that happens in engineering where we, uh, you know, we have to actually specify uh, a number of different things. Basically involves making choices as to uh, what specific parameters you're going to have for a device and that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to really start covering the idea of the design of springs, not today, but uh, the next time that we meet. What I'd like to do today is actually begin by covering a few of the uh, types of things that we can design for, right, and kind of cover what they are and um, do that in the context of this problem right here. Uh, so we, in this problem, we need to be able to support 200 pounds of load, all right, and uh, we're going to do that with a, a steel spring that has nine total coils. Uh, the ends of it are going to be squared and ground. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, the wire uh, diameter that composes the spring is uh, 0.15 inch in diameter. Uh, the outer coil diameter of this spring, we're going to try for one inch. The free length, that's basically the length that the spring takes on uh, when it has no load applied to it. The free length is six inches. And um, for right now, we are going to postpone the idea of trying to determine uh, how much strength a particular material has. I'm going to save that for next time. So for right now, we're going to figure out things like the uh, amount of stress carried in the spring. We're going to figure out uh, things like spring constant uh, and the deflection of the spring. Um, there's a whole other issue that uh, is probably easiest for me to describe. Uh, I don't know, have you ever taken a ballpoint pen apart? Okay, and it has a little spring inside of there, right? Have you ever taken the little spring that's inside of a ballpoint pen and pushed it down? All right, when you do that, often what happens? Okay, it kind of shoots out to the side, right? Well, that's called buckling, right? And that is a thing that springs can do. They can buckle, uh, and so we're going to figure out, we, we typically refer to this as the stability of the spring. We're going to figure out um, how stable a spring like this one is that I have in this uh, example, and, um, and then kind of determine also there, there is a set of parameters that you can achieve that will make a spring um, unconditionally stable, basically absolutely stable, meaning there's... Um, you know, as you, as you squeeze the spring, there's no load that you can apply that will make it want to go, make it want to buckle, all right? So we're going to figure out that. Um, and we're basically going to kind of edit a couple of the parameters for our spring so that we wind up with the same spring constant as we started out with, but that we have a spring that is unconditionally stable, okay? Um, there are a few other uh, factors that we're going to figure out as well. One of them is called a fractional overrun to closure. One of them is called a spring index. And uh, I think running through a quick example like this one is a good way to get started with springs. And then we'll talk about uh, more interesting design tasks uh, whenever we have our next example. Okay. And uh, maybe just one little teaser for that. The reason that springs are kind of fun and interesting to design is that you have uh, a larger number of constraints that you can edit that sort of, they're sort of all interdependent, interdependent with one another. So you can edit things like how many coils, what the wire diameter is, what the coil diameter is. Uh, you can edit um, even things like what the, how the ends are. A lot of times you have to design a spring so that it either sit in a hole or go around a rod. There's a lot of different things that go into designing a spring. And so, anyway, that's kind of a little teaser for next time. We're going to look at a spring design problem next time. For, but for right now, we'll look at this one. All right. So, where shall we start with this? this is a, it's got to carry this 200-pound load. We need to find the maximum stress carried in this spring. Okay? So, 
Uh, where we want to look for that is uh, we'll start in, this is in chapter 10, and where it kind of starts discussing the idea of stress is actually on page 511. Um, and one of the things that it, it goes through here is the idea that in a, the wire of a spring, it is primarily carrying a torsional stress. So as you begin to squish a spring downward, uh, what that does is it actually changes what's called the pitch of the spring. That is the number of coils uh, per inch, or you know you can think of it actually two different ways: coils per inch or inch, you know, number of length per coil. Right? You change that as you squish the spring down, and as you do that, it actually begins to twist the wire that composes the spring, and that's what generates the largest component of stress in the, uh, the element of the spring, okay? But it's not the only thing that induces stress in the spring because there is also a direct shear that is induced in the spring just from this fact that, you know, if you kind of think of where the spring would, uh, you know, let's say it kind of is moving up like this, um, and then you might imagine making a cut between one location and another within this spring material, okay? kind of think of there being a cut right there and you're pushing here and there's and you're reacting against that down here so I'm focusing on, on like one coil of this spring what you'll notice is that at that location where you made the cut there has to be a reaction this way and another reaction this way at that cut just to transmit that linear load that translational type of load from one piece of it to the other okay and so that is more of a direct shear as opposed to a torsional shear that is, they're both um, induced in the spring simultaneously. Well, when these two things are induced in there, uh, along with another effect that we're not gonna get very deep into, but that I'll mention, there's another effect that's called the curvature effect. So because this is not a straight rod that we are twisting, and instead it's this curved rod that we're twisting, there is another you can think of it kind of like a stress concentration, although I'll probably try to avoid that, that use of that term. It basically creates um, a distribution of stress that's not quite as flat or a, as uniform um, whenever uh, it has this curvature in the member. So to account for those things, there is this really cool factor, uh, it's a cool name anyway, uh, called a Bergstrasser factor that we get to use for uh, determining how we can edit what we would have thought the stress was in the spring. And so the way we calculate that Bergstrasser factor, K sub B, we actually have to start by calculating something that is called a spring index, okay? So spring index, okay? We give it the capital letter C and spring index is uh, outer, di or it's not outer, excuse me, the coil diameter, capital D, over the wire diameter, which is lowercase d, okay? So capital D is the coil diameter, lowercase d is the wire diameter, okay? Now, when we say coil diameter, what do you think we actually mean there? And I'm trying to be kind of specific here because in various applications, you may get information about your spring that may not be the exact coil diameter that you want to plug in here. You might notice I used the phrase outer coil diameter when I described this spring right here. What do you think the other alternatives might be? Okay, could have the inner or you could have the mean, as they say, the mean coil diameter. Whenever we have this capital D in these uh, equations, we are referring to the mean coil diameter. Okay, and so for us, we need to do something to edit our one inch outer coil diameter so that we can plug it in to find the mean coil diameter. What do you think you do there? Okay, let me do a, just a quick little figure uh, to kind of make this make sense. What if I was to kind of do a cross section through this spring so that you see this would be one cross section of one wire and this is where it came back around on the other side right and they're offset there a little bit because there's this pitch to the spring 
what I gave you initially was basically this outer diameter to the outer edge, right? That was what, you know, the one inch that I gave you. What I'm telling you here is that we want the mean coil diameter is basically center line to center line. Okay. Well, how do I get that if I know the outer diameter is one inch? Okay. Subtract one wire diameter gets you there because it's two wire radii, right? So that gives you one wire diameter. And so this gives you basically one inch minus 0.15 for this example problem, 0.15 inch. Okay, and so that's what we're going to plug in right here. One inch minus 0.15 inch. Okay, and then um, what about my wire diameter? 0.15 inch. And if you're wondering where I got this equation, this is at the top of page 511. It's equation 10-1. Okay, and so what we get out of this for our uh, spring index is a value of 5.667. Okay, do I need units on that or not? Okay, that is a unitless quantity, so we do not need units on it. Um, one other thing I'll just note here, because we might need this later, uh, the actual D that we wind up with, D wound up being 0.85. That's easy enough to see how that came about. Okay. I, I know I included it in the numerator of that equation, but I'll go ahead and say that that's D. And then this right here is capital C spring index. All right. Well, why do I need this? There are a few places that this shows up. But the first place that it matters to us is calculating this thing called the Bergstrasser factor. Okay, and one thing to note right here for the Bergstrasser factor is that there are other alternatives that you can use to estimate uh, a factor that gives you this actual maximum stress in the coils of the spring that accounts for direct shear as well as the curvature effect. However, um, I am not going to be using those in this course. There's another one that's called the wall factor, W-A-H-L, uh, and it's right there on the same page. For, for what we're doing in here, there's no real reason why we need to use anything else besides the Bergstrasser factor, which is a little bit simpler to write than the wall factor. And they actually have a little discussion about that in there. Um, it says there, since the results of these two equations differ on the order of about 1%, uh, there's no reason to use uh, the wall factor as opposed to using the Bergstrasser, which is simpler, okay? So this is the Bergstrasser factor, K, capital K sub B, okay? It is found with four times the spring index uh, plus two over four times the spring index minus three. Okay, so for us, that's 4 times 5.667 uh, plus 2 over 4 times 5.667 minus 3. Okay, and when we plug that in, we get a value of 1.254. Okay, if you're curious where I got that equation, uh, page 511, equation 10-5. Okay, where I wind up using the Bergstrasser factor is over on the next page, page 512. It gives you a statement for the amount of shearing stress that's induced in a spring. It's equation 10-7. It tells you that tau is going to be equal to K sub B. Okay, so this is shearing stress. Tau is equal to K sub B. I'll just go ahead and put in the numbers, 1.254 <coughs> times a fraction there where I have 8 times F times D. So I have 8 times F 
F is the force that you have to carry with your spring, so for us that's 200 pounds. Then it gives you capital D there. Capital D, again, is the mean coil diameter, so that is 0.85 uh, inches. Okay. And then this gets, gets divided by pi times lowercase d to the third power. And then d there, the lowercase d, is the wire diameter, so I put in a 0.15 inch. Okay. This is equation 10-7. Uh, All right, and so then I, uh, I calculate this, and it turns out to be 160.877 KSI. Let me ask you a quick question. Does that kind of seem like a lot? Okay, yeah, it should seem a little bit like, you know, it should seem just a little bit odd to you. Um, again, I'm not going to really cover the idea of the strength of the materials in depth today, but let me say that does seem like it's a little high to me. However, um, I would guess that, uh, you know, because spring materials tend to be made out of high strength steels, um, you know, it, it might be close to being in a range that might be okay. Although I would typically mentally sort of have it pegged somewhere between about 130 and about 150 to be your maximum shear stress that you might be able to be okay in a, uh, in a material. So as I look at that, I start getting slightly alarmed, but uh, we'll, again, we'll cover that concept of how to find the strength in a uh, spring material. We'll do that next time. All right, so that is the answer to part A, find the maximum shearing stress carried in the spring, 160.877 KSI. All right, what do we do next? The next thing we want to do is to find the spring constant and the deflection of the spring under this load. Okay. <clears throat> so for that, for the, uh, the spring constant question, There's again a, uh, a pretty cool derivation that happens on page 512 where they use an energy method to figure out what the spring constant equation becomes. They then uh, use a slight simplification of what the spring constant equation would predict. That is a simplification that I'm okay with using generally. All right? So uh, it's generally for most springs, it is a small correction uh, between the two, and so I'm just going to say use equation 10-9. Okay, equation 10-9 says that your spring constant is going to be equal to the wire diameter to the fourth, okay, 0.15 inches to the fourth, times the modulus of rigidity, it uses the, the variable there of G. Well, again, uh, one of the things that I'm going to say for next time is all of these material properties, whether those be the strength of the wire material or the, uh, you know, these elastic constants. For now, let's just go what we would go with if we didn't know anything different about this material. Okay, where would you look up a value for G uh, if you needed that for just steel? Yeah, table uh, 1015, it says there carbon steel 11.5 MPSI. Okay, 11.5 times 10 to the sixth uh, PSI. And again, for right now, um, I'm skipping the idea of um, specific elastic modulus values for spring materials, okay? little uh, hint, 
we are about to get into a situation where these values, both strength as well as um, the uh, elastic modulus values, are going to become variable next time we meet. They are no longer going to be constant values. So another preview of coming attractions. All right, so we have that. D to the fourth times G over 8 times D cubed. Okay, D being the mean coil diameter. What was that? 0.85 inches. And then N. N is the number of coils. Okay. <clears throat> Now this is gonna take us a little bit of thinking, okay? Because all it says is just N, and we have a specific kind of coils, right? We have, we have nine total coils, that's what it says right here, of steel wire, and the wire has a diameter of 0.1 inch. It says its outer coil diameter is one inch, free length six inches, and its ends are squared and ground, okay? take a little sidebar right here and show you what we mean by squared and ground ends. You've probably seen stuff like this before, but there are a number of different ways that you can prepare the end of compression springs, like what we have here, okay? Um, the most simple way to have the end of a spring is just called plain, all right? So the plain end of a spring just basically means it's where it's got that helical shape, it just sort of ends. Right. What's the disadvantage of having an end like that on a spring, you think? All right. Yeah, what happens there is that you, you know, the spring is most likely going to have to contact some sort of a surface to do its work, right? And what happens there, if you just have a plain end, is that contact is going to tend to be uh, on one point on the end of the spring, and a question I have for you, is that point going to be centralized along the axis that's actually transmitting the force of the spring? Okay, you kind of think of the spring is more or less, you know, if you look at it from above, it's gonna kind of be shaped like a donut, and the axis along which you are applying force to the spring is typically right down the middle of the spring, and what we're doing if we have just a plain end is that means our reaction force is going to happen at some other location out on the periphery of where the spring is. So what's going to happen then if you have that kind of an end? Are you going to induce a, uh, a moment, a bending moment in the spring? Yeah, I would imagine you probably will. And you're going to actually... Uh, increase the probability or kind of uh, exacerbate the, the tendency for springs that they might want to buckle, all right? So uh, we typically don't have plain ends unless you have some sort of a, another piece that is designed to interface with the spring uh, on that plain end, okay? If you just have your, your spring bearing against a flat surface, it is much more common to do at least one of the other three options here. Okay, um, one of those options is just a squared end or a closed end, and that's this one right here, squared or closed. Okay, what you do there is in the last coil of the spring, uh, the manufacturer of the spring changes the pitch slightly so that it makes it uh, to where that last coil ends up with a flat area over which the force can bear. All right, it still doesn't give you uh, a large you know, number of uh, degrees around the periphery of the thing that, that uh, contact, but it now increases it to where instead of it being like one point, maybe it would be able to distribute it over, you know, almost half or so of the, uh, of the circumference of the spring might be able to have some contact there. All right, that's one way to do it. It still, if, if you have it that way, it still will induce a bending moment in the spring, and that's still not necessarily the best way to go about it. Another way to do it is with a ground end. So you basically leave it plain. You don't change the pitch, but instead you grind it so that the last uh, little coil of wire there ends up being ground off a little bit. 
okay? This is another way that you can distribute that force more around the whole circle. But the way most springs um, are that, are that are made to contact things this way, they actually have this one that I've specified here, and that is a squared and ground end, meaning you do both. You change the pitch for that last coil, and then you grind it, okay? And what that does is by changing the pitch and grinding it, it gives you a lot of uh, area over which that spring is going to contact, and it more or less balances uh, the line of action of the force in the spring with the point, the effective point of contact uh, between the spring and its surface that it's bearing against, okay? I know that's a bit of a long discussion, but I figured I'd talk about these different ends because it, these will come up and it's good for you to know uh, about them. Can't tell you the number of times I've seen something sort of jury rigged together and uh, when it's jury rigged together, someone might chop off a spring just however they chop it off and it ends up making the spring less effective than if it has more prepared ends on it. So anyway, we have squared and ground ends. Um, there's a little table, table 10-1. It's not the table that I have here, but there's a table 10-1 where it gives you some different ways that you can evaluate things like the number of coils and other things um, for the various kinds of end conditions on these springs. And you might notice in table 10-1, if you have a total number of coils n sub t, well actually let me, let me do it this way, n sub a is the number of active coils. That is the n that we want right here. This, this value that we put right here is supposed to be the number of active coils, which is denoted n sub a. We know n sub t, this is n sub t up here with the nine coils, and so we need a way to get down to that, and it says here, that the total number of coils is equal to the number of active coils plus two, according to table 10-1 for uh, squared and ground ends, okay? So that means we take nine and subtract two, and it gives us seven active coils for a squared and ground end, okay? And this is the, the uh, value that we're going to use, even though in the middle of the page on page 513, it has a little discussion about the fact that, um, you know, it's, it basically makes a reference to one source that says that it's not always exactly uh, two end coils that you have there, but we're gonna use two, even though it kind of makes that little note on, in the middle of page 513. All right, I know that was a long uh, discussion in the middle of that, but basically we needed to come up with a number of active coils and that was on page uh, 513, table 10-1. Yeah, I think I, mean, I did possibly miss that. Yes, I did miss that. Okay, thanks. All right, just too excited about talking about end coils, so. All right, now let's go ahead and figure out what this value is. This ends up being um, 169.285 okay. pounds per inch. All right, but that doesn't tell us uh, how far it is going to deflect under this 200 pound load. How do we figure that part out? Yeah, so, you know, the basic uh, spring equation, which is just F equals K delta. Okay, what we're trying to figure out next is delta, and so we figure out, um, that delta is just F over K. Okay, 
and this gives us a deflection of 1.181 inches. Sometimes this is known as Hooke's Law. <clears throat> All right, so let's see where we are so far. We found the maximum stress, we found the spring constant, and the deflection of the spring uh, under that load. <clears throat> All right, the next thing that we want to do is figure out um, this thing called a fractional overrun to closure. All right, that's kind of a mouthful. Uh, the variable that we use for it isn't much easier to handle. It is the Greek letter xi. Which always reminds me, every time I try to write that, um, there was a uh, video game a long time, called Cube, long time ago called Cubert, and there was a little snake that would bounce around on the, the pyramid, and I always think of that snake whenever I write this letter for some reason. All right. So this actually shows up, um, this is the fractional overrun to closure, okay? And I'm covering it now because it ends up being uh, a very handy tool for us to use whenever we do more optimized spring design. For right now, it doesn't make as much sense, but I'm going ahead and, and uh, showing you this value. Uh, if you turn over to um, page 520, you'll see there it actually doesn't ever give you an, just a one equation for this fractional overrun to closure. Instead, it, it kind of implicitly defines it in equation uh, 1017. And equation 1017 says Fs, which is the solid length of, or solid uh, force that a spring carries. That's basically, we haven't talked about when a spring goes solid, all right, but a spring goes solid when all the coils end up touching each other, right? As you compress the spring down, there's a point where you've, ex you've compressed it as far as it can go and all the coils will actually contact and keep it from going any farther. That is referred to as the spring going solid, all right? F sub S is the force that the spring carries at the point where it goes solid, okay? And this is going to be equal to one plus xi um, times F max, all right? F max is the amount of force that you actually need the, for the uh, spring to carry in its actual use, right? So for us, that would be our 200 pounds. Okay, so where we're trying to figure out our fractional overrun to closure, we basically insert the things that we know here. Um, we know F max already. We're trying to find xi. What we need to do is figure out F sub S in order to deal with this. Okay, well that means that we need to know how long is the spring when it is solid. or I actually call it the solid length of the spring. And as you can probably imagine, if you're designing a system to be, um, you know, to, to use a spring with, how often do you feel like intentionally making a spring go solid happens? Yeah, not, I can't say it never happens, but that is not normal, right? In most cases, if you're designing something to have a spring, you don't want it to go solid. You try to protect against it, and that's one of the points of having this parameter here of a fractional overrun to closure. It's a, basically a number that tells you, you know, how close are you to uh, actually causing the spring to go solid, okay? All right, so where we figure out how long the solid length is of the spring, it's again in table 10-1, okay? For squared and ground ends, it says that it's the wire diameter 
times the total number of coils. Okay, so again, that's in table 10.1 for squared and ground. It says that your solid length, that's L sub S, is going to be D times the total number of coils, D times N sub T. And for us, that's going to be 0.15 inches times 9. Okay, and that ends up giving me 1.35 inches. All right, well, how does that help me? Okay, yeah, now I can figure out how much deflection I need to go solid, right? Because I know the free length is six inches and it goes solid at 1.35 inches, that means the deflection, which I'll call delta sub s, this is the amount of deflection when it goes solid, is just going to be equal to six inches minus 1.35 inches. Okay, and that gives me uh, 4.65 inches. All right. <clears throat> well, once I know the delta, I still have Hooke's law that I can use, right? And so that allows me to figure out what my amount of force is when it goes solid, and it's just going to be the spring constant of 169.285. Pounds per inch. multiplied by 4.65 inches. Okay, and this ends up being 787.15, excuse me, 17, 787.17 pounds. All right, so now that we know that, we should be able to go in here and find xi. So basically it is 787.17 pounds is equal to one plus, <clears throat> xi times my maximum force 200 pounds. And if you solve for that fractional overrun to closure, it ends up giving you 2.936. All right. Quick little sidebar here, now that we figured out the fractional overrun to closure, and before we get into the uh, spring stability question, you might have noticed when we were over there on the page where they defined the fractional overrun to closure, page 520, it gives a bunch of guidelines on that page for um, kind of expected parameters that you might have if you're doing spring design, kind of some ranges in which you expect springs to fall. And it says there, the fractional overrun to closure is expected to be greater than or equal to 0.15. Well, we're definitely greater than or equal to 0.15, okay, with 2.936. Um, basically, kind of what this gives you is, uh, you can think of that 0.15 as being sort of, you know, at least in rough terms, you still have 15% or so more that you could squish it down before you go solid, right? What this is telling us here is that we still have a long way that we can go before we squish it solid, right? But I figured I'd go ahead and introduce this as a parameter because it's one that we're going to talk about when we get together next time. 
The other thing I'll mention while we're on that page, it says the number of active coils is typically between 3 and 15. So we're within that range for this spring. It also tells you that it's common to have a spring index that is between 4 and 12. So we're also in that range as well. This is, if, if you're curious where I'm looking, this is page 520 um, at about the middle of the page. All right. So I think we just finished with part C. Next one. Will the spring buckle under this applied load? And then, you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Uh, what load would it take to make it buckle? Okay. So this, uh, this question is most important if you have a spring that is not supported uh, from buckling. All right. And that's a common thing that you may have seen. There's a couple of common ways that you can support a spring from buckling. Uh, one of them is that you can put a rod through the middle of it, in which case it won't buckle because the rod will prevent it from buckling. Or you can, you can actually sink the spring down into a hole, in which case the walls of the hole will support the spring from buckling. All right? But if you have a spring that's free like this one, this is an important question to actually make sure uh, you don't have a, the possibility that you could buckle a spring. Have you ever seen a device or something that had a spring kind of out in the open like this where it had some susceptibility to buckling. Does anything like pop into your mind? Rail car suspension. Yeah, so I think that's probably true. Someone says a rail car suspension or, uh, you know, I've seen definitely the suspension on some vehicles where they use a coil spring and the coil spring doesn't have anything that keeps it from buckling. Well, if that's the case, then they would have to do uh, an evaluation like this to make sure that that spring wouldn't pop out of that uh, application that could cause injury and whatnot if it popped out like you squeezing the spring of a ballpoint pen. All right, so buckling. All right, um, the very first equation that I want to point your attention to is equation 1010. Here's what it says. It says Y critical, okay? I don't particularly like that uh, denotation. I actually prefer to call this delta critical. They probably pulled this equation out of a specific uh, reference book somewhere where they used Y because they were probably setting it up where Y was the dimension of this. I prefer to think of this as the, the amount of spring deflection, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and say, for equation 1010, I'm going to rewrite this as delta sub CR. This is the critical um, amount of deflection that the spring is at when it will buckle, you know, if it will buckle. And so we'll go here and say this will be equal to the free length of the spring times a parameter that they call C1 prime. We'll get into that in just a second. 1 minus 1 minus uh, C2 prime over, okay, this lambda EFF, this is called the effective slenderness ratio for the spring, okay, and that value is squared. And then all of this in those parentheses there is taken to the 1 half power. <clears throat> Okay, which means there's a few parameters, you know, the only parameter that we're actually good with right now is this L sub zero, which is the free length. What's the free length? Okay, six inches long is the free length of our spring. But the C1 prime and the C2 prime and the effective slenderness ratio are things that we don't know yet. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to start with the slenderness ratio. Okay. Okay, and uh, to get this, it is alpha, oh, that's another parameter that we don't know yet, times uh, this free length over the mean coil diameter for your spring. Okay, now alpha. Alpha is a value that uh, allows you to account for various end conditions on springs. 
Okay. And uh, you may have noticed when we were over here to the right just a moment ago that I had this other table up here. It says end condition constants alpha for helical compression springs. All right. And it gives you a few different uh, descriptions of end conditions of springs. Okay. One of them says springs supported between flat parallel surfaces. Okay. Or, you know, the other, other uh, thing that you can have there are fixed ends. All right. Is that what we have? Okay, it is, and that's one of the reasons I drew this like I did. This 200 pounds is constrained from uh, moving side to side, and it's also constrained from rotation by how it is sliding. What that's doing is it's keeping uh, this surface right here parallel with this surface right here, and I have squared and ground ends on my spring. That meets all of these criteria and conditions that I need to be able to say, that this is my end condition for this spring. Okay. Before I move on too much, let's look at some of the other end conditions. It says one end supported by a flat surface perpendicular to the spring axis and the other end pivoted. That basically means the other end of the spring is no longer supported from rotation at the location where it is uh, connected. So it, basically one end uh, has angular support and the other end is free to swivel, okay? And so that changes what that end condition is of alpha, and actually, you might notice it'll increase the slenderness effectively of the, uh, of the spring. The other thing you can have is both ends are pivoted, or you can have one end clamped and the other end free, okay? That would basically be what you would have for the one end clamped, other end free, that would be, what if I had no supports? What if none of this supporting structure here was here for the 200 pounds, and instead I just rested the 200 pounds on a spring out in the open somewhere? Okay. Uh, have you guys ever ridden on those uh, playground uh, devices where you, you sit on it, and it's this big spring that sticks up underneath probably some animal that has uh, handles on it? You'll know what I'm talking about when you have kids. But... Um, and then you can kind of swing around on it. That would be that situation where you, uh, you know, there's just a spring that sticks up and then you put a load down on it and there's nothing else that supports it. And that uh, also contributes to the effective slenderness of a spring as if you have less support for the end of it. All right, but we have a value there of 0.5 for alpha. Okay, the, uh, the length there, six inches, that's our free length, and then our mean coil diameter was 0.85 inches. Okay, this winds up giving me 3.529. Okay. Now, these are two constants, C1 prime and C2 prime, that these don't even really have names. It sa actually says they're dimensionless elastic constants. Okay, that's all I know about them. They're not given equation numbers. They're just in there, all right? So this one is given with um, E over 2 times E minus G. Okay, what do you think E is for our material? Okay, 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI, at least for right now, because I, we haven't gotten into the variable material properties that you can have for real spring materials. Right now we're just saying it's steel. All right, um, down here I have 2 times 30 times 10 to the 6. PSI minus 11.5 times 10 to the sixth PSI. Okay, and this ends up giving me 0.811. Both of them just have one prime on them. C2 
prime is given with 2 pi squared times e minus g over 2g plus e. So for us, this is 2 pi squared times 30 times 10 to the 6th psi minus 11.5 times 10 to the 6th psi. <coughs> All this over 2 times 11.5 times 10 to the 6th PSI plus 30 times 10 to the 6th PSI. Okay. And the number that pops out of there is 6.89. All right. All right. Now you plug these things in. To that equation, which I won't bore you with actually doing that out. Um, I think it's relatively clear. And what you get <coughs> is 1.613 inches. Now, how does that help you answer the question as to whether or not this spring will buckle under the load that you've applied? Okay. This basically says if you have a or more, then your spring is expected to buckle. So then you look at how far did we deflect it, which was down here a little ways. 1.181 inches versus 1.613. We basically predict that this spring will not buckle. All right, or I'll say we don't expect the spring to buckle. Because 1.613 inches is greater than 1.181 inches. All right. So then an obvious question at that point is, well, yeah, but what if you overload it a little bit? Right? What if you put 250 pounds on here or 300 pounds on here? At some point, it might go far enough to where it would buckle, and that might make a problem. There's a lot of times a really good reason why you would want to make sure that you will not have a spring that will buckle um, under any circumstances. Okay, And so that's kind of where we go with the next question on buckling, is how do you make it unconditionally stable, or you know, they call it absolutely stable. Okay, And so equation 1012. Uh, Equation 1012 lets you calculate, and it's kind of an interesting equation because it's doing it with respect to a free length. For us, we know what free length we have. It says if this is, as long as this is less than pi times the mean coil diameter over that end condition constant alpha, this multiplied by 2 times e minus g over 2g uh, plus e, all this to the one half power. Okay, if this condi condition is met, then the spring will not buckle under any circumstances. So it will be unconditionally stable. Yes, sir. Um, what load would make it buckle? Okay, yeah, thanks for, uh, for reminding me. You guys are keeping me on track here. The question that we, uh, that we missed right there was what load would make it buckle? Okay, well, how would you do that? We'll put this on pause for just a second. 
Okay? Hooke's law would say, if you want to figure out what load makes it buckle, you just basically say, um, you know, maybe F sub CR, this is your critical buckling force, is going to be equal to that amount of deflection, 1.613 uh, inches times K. And K, the spring constant, was down here 169.285 pounds per inch. Okay. And I may not have actually put that in here, so let me, uh, on, my, on my note sheet. So, figure this out. 1.613 times 169.285. Okay, 273 pounds or so, 273.06. Right, if you want to, you know it pretty much that exactly, right? Kidding. All right. So what you do to figure out for this absolute stability question, getting back into that, <clears throat> we would plug in our values that we know for this. We know we have a six inch uh, free length and the threshold at which uh, this, you know, this happens is going to be the equal to condition instead of the less than condition, right? So we put in pi times, uh, and I think what we're supposed to do here is figure out the minimum outer diameter you would need if you want the spring to have absolute stability, okay? So that's actually the variable we're gonna try to solve for, okay? Alpha remains 0.5 over here we have 2 times uh, 30 times 10 to the 6 psi minus 11.5 times 10 to the 6 psi all this over 2 times 11.5 times 10 to the 6 psi plus 30 times 10 to the 6 psi When you solve this for your mean coil diameter, it gives you one point one four three inches. Okay, so essentially what we're suggesting here is that if we could make our spring just a little bit bigger in diameter, then that will make it more stable and to the point where it would never buckle um, throughout its entire range. Uh, good thing to note here, I believe what I asked us to find in the question was, find the minimum outer diameter needed if you want the spring to have absolute stability. Is this the outer diameter? Okay, so this would be Therefore, the OD for the new spring is going to be equal to 1.143 inches plus what? Okay. Or will it be 1.5 inches? We might need to do another part of this question first, okay? Because the next part of this question says, yeah, but you want to keep this thing with the same spring constant as you had before, right? So that means we're going to have to do something, uh, and one of the ways you can change that is by choosing a different wire diameter for the spring. I don't know where that came from. Oh, that came from down here. All right. Okay, and so let's do that part. So this is um, new wire diameter. Okay, we still want to have our 169, remember that was our spring constant, 169.285 pounds per inch. 
as our spring constant. We're going to plug this into our uh, equation here for spring constant, which was back on page 512. D to the fourth, okay. That's what we're trying to solve for. G. over 8 times our mean coil diameter. Remember, you know, that, that we just go ahead and put in as 1.143 inches. Uh, and that would be cubed times our number of coils. We want to keep that the same as well. So we still put in seven coils like we did before. And we solve for, for lowercase d. Okay, and when we do that, it ends up giving us 0 0.1873. <clears throat> okay, and so that tells us here that we plug that in right here, 0 0.1873 inches. And that gives us our new outer diameter. Okay, and that gives me 1.33 inches. All right. What else do we have here? With the updated wire and outer diameters, find the new fractional overrun to closure spring index and maximum stress in the spring. Okay. And then the last thing is the stress in the updated spring at its solid height. Let me ask you this question. You feel comfortable doing those things? Okay. If you feel comfortable doing those things, let me do this. I will give you the results that I got, and if you care to, you can work through and make sure that you get the same thing that I got. Does that sound like a plan? All right, so here I'll say these are the answers to parts, what were they, G and H? I think we did F in order to find the last part of E. Okay, so parts G and H. Okay. For that, the solid length that you wind up with is 1.686. Uh, that leads you to a amount of deflection when you are solid of 4.314 inches. Okay, and this leads you to a force at the solid length uh, of 730.35 pounds. Okay. And if you use those values, then you find your fractional overrun to closure <coughs> of 2.652. Okay. Additionally, your new spring index is 6.102. Your new Bergstrasser factor is 1.234. And your amount of shearing stress that you wind up with is 109.28. Okay, so you actually were able to lower the stress that's in KSI. You were able to lower the stress a little bit 
by doing that. All right. Any other questions? Good deal. I'll see you on Wednesday.